Would you live in a house, raise a family there, even if you knew that a horrific crime had taken place within its walls? Could you overcome the negative energy or let it consume you? One family had to answer these questions as what appeared to be their dream home became a living nightmare. This is the infamously haunting story of the Amityville Horror of Long Island, New York, also known as the Lutz Family Case, and you most certainly will not want to watch this video in a dark room. In this video, I'm partnering with Incogni. Incogni is an amazing service that solves one of today's worst problems, your personal data being collected and sold. And this is happening to almost everyone without them even being aware of it. There are thousands of data brokers harvesting your personal information to then sell it to unknown businesses to be used as they please. The good news, however, you have the right to request data brokers to delete all of your information that they have and to protect your privacy. The bad news, however, is that this would take years to manually do. But that's where Incogni comes in to do all the messy work for you, automatically and seamlessly. Incogni will contact those brokers and ensure that your personal data is removed to protect your identity and privacy. All you have to do is sign up using my link today, create an account, grant Incogni the right to do the work for you, and relax and watch as they handle it all, keeping you updated at every step of the way. So protect yourself, your privacy, and all of your data with Incogni today. Use my promo code or click the link pinned below to get started. The year is 1975. George Lutz taps an anxious finger on his steering wheel as he eyed the windows of the house ahead of him. His wife Kathy smiled as they slowly pulled into the driveway. The two were hoping to find a new home for them and their three children and have seemingly stumbled upon the perfect house for the perfect price. As they speak with the realtor, they are amazed at the sheer size and beauty of the home. It had many rooms, ornate woodwork, a boathouse, and access to water. It was truly a massive property, especially compared to what they had been used to. However, towards the end of the tour, the real estate agent would inform them that a year prior, the home had been the site of multiple grisly murders and famous ones locally at that, the DeFeo family. The home of course had been cleaned and remodeled. Without being told, no one would even know that anything had ever occurred there, or so they thought. So after a brief discussion among themselves, the Lutz were sold based on the sheer beauty and low price. So they decided to make an offer on the home, and their offer was quickly accepted. They purchased what they thought was their dream come true, a fresh start for their large family, granting everyone the room they would need to grow and live. After closing the deal and securing the keys, the family would begin to move in the weeks to come. During the move, the family thought to have the house blessed, and the priest who would carry this out was a man named Father Ray. As he carried furniture into the house, George motioned for Ray to come on in. So, there to do a specific job, and not wanting to interfere with the moving efforts, Father Ray went about his business and began to bless the house. Moving from room to room, praying, and sprinkling droplets of holy water upon the walls, in an hour or so, Father Ray was finished and stepped out of the house. However, upon making eye contact with George, he had a very concerned look on his face. George attempted to pay him for taking the time to come out and help them, but Father Ray declined. Before the priest left, 
He said that he felt something strange in one of the upstairs bedrooms. A dark, menacing presence. He hoped the blessing would help, but was concerned if anyone was going to be specifically staying in that room. George would reassure Father Ray by telling him that they weren't planning on using that bedroom for anything other than sewing. Ray would reply with, Good, just as long as no one sleeps in there. Weirded out by the interaction, but assuming the father was just a bit superstitious with his Catholic beliefs, George would finish up moving the family in, and they would all enjoy dinner together in their new home for the first time. They all seemingly were in love, but those wonderful butterflies floating in their stomachs would soon turn to ravenous locusts. Shortly after the Lutzes moved into their new home, they would begin to experience small, odd happenings. These events would include feeling spots of intense cold randomly throughout various areas of the house, as well as seeing shadowy figures out of the corner of their eyes. But as they would rush to see whatever it was, the apparition would quickly vanish, and these figures would seemingly contribute to the omnipresent feeling of being watched by invisible eyes. As the family continued to live in the house, drip by drip, a sense of unease began to fill the air. The phenomenon would continue, and soon the family would begin to be jolted awake in the night typically around 3.30 a.m. Loud banging noises, as if a gun had been fired inside the house or within very close proximity to their ears, violently shattering any peaceful sleep they may have been having. However, upon waking up, fully panicked, there was nothing out of place. No one in the house that wasn't supposed to be there, and all the doors and windows were closed and locked. The culmination of this strange activity would only continue to escalate. One morning, the family woke up to a startling sight. A bizarre, black, slime-like substance was oozing from the keyholes of their home, and a trail of this mystery liquid was leading from room to room. Never having seen anything like it, George, who was very adept in construction, was confused to say the least. Unsure of what else to do, and with the day looming to start, they would slowly just all clean it up. As days turned to several weeks since the Lutz family had moved into the Amityville home, the loud noises that would wake them during the night would only continue to get worse and would soon also be accompanied by footsteps and banging throughout the house at all hours of the day and night. During one episode, George had woke out of a sound sleep randomly and was unable to go back to bed. As he made his way to the kitchen for a drink, he heard what sounded like music blasting from the basement. He knew there wasn't a stereo or radio present down there. With the hair on the back of his neck standing on end, he would slowly descend the stairs. But upon his foot leaving the last step and landing on the basement floor, the music would cease. Despite what he had heard just minutes prior, there was no sign of anything or anyone. This event was particularly unnerving because George was not privy to superstitious or strange things. He didn't believe in ghosts or anything of the sort. But even with these convictions, he failed to come to terms with what he had just experienced. In the coming days, the family began to notice more unsettling manifestations within their home. It's the middle of December now, and the sewing room, the same room that Father Ray had felt uncomfortable in had slowly but surely began to be infested with flies. This was bizarre to say the least. 
Although not impossible, it is very rare for flies to infest a particular area, especially in the middle of winter. At first, they thought perhaps the house being older, maybe it was something they weren't used to experiencing. But despite their best efforts to rid themselves of the insects, they could never fully get rid of the infestation. Day in and day out, maggots and flies seemingly materialized out of nowhere. The Lutz family soon found themselves changing in various ways. George began to seclude himself from his family and developed a strange obsession with the fireplace constantly complaining that he was cold. He chopped and stockpiled as much wood as he possibly could, but no matter how many logs he piled on the flames of the fire, the fire never seemed to manage to warm him. Kathy too began to change and experience her own events, and her experiences happened when she was often alone and vulnerable. She would feel the ice-cold touch of unseen hands, and at one point, the hands even braided her hair. These events were too eventually witnessed by George. One night, as the winter moon hung above them, the couple slept. Kathy then suddenly woke up with a gasp. However, upon turning to his wife to ask her what was wrong, George saw staring back at him as he awakened, the face of an old woman, instead of the face of his wife. The shock quickly turned to terror as the couple attempted to figure out just what had happened to Kathy. With her at a loss for words as she gazed into the mirror with her husband, just as quick as it had came, the mirage would dissipate hours later, revealing Kathy's youthful face once again. The Lutzes by this time knew that they had been dealing with something paranormal, although they were surprised to be thinking that, George especially. At first, not wanting to involve anyone else with whatever presence that was in the house, they tried blessing the home themselves. Kathy, who had always been religious, was the one who attempted the blessing. She moved from room to room, opening up the windows and blessing each space. Things seemed to be going well until suddenly one of the windows slammed upon one of their children's hands. This was no ordinary injury, however. The boy's hands were horribly bruised and pounded flat. George would later describe them as flat as a pancake and that he immediately knew that they had to get him to the hospital. Panic set in as the family geared up to rush to the hospital, but as they all approached the front door, their son's hands were somehow now completely normal. This was bizarre for George, Kathy, as well as the other children to witness, to say the least, but it was just as shocking to their son as well. None of them could figure out what had just taken place. It was as if the house didn't want them to leave. Another shift began to take place among the family following this experience. Tension within the home became so thick that you could cut it with a knife. George and Kathy began to fight and were now barely talking. The children too would begin to act more aggressively towards one another, as well as their parents, leading to escalating punishments. And throughout this time, the youngest child, Missy, developed a relationship with an imaginary friend that she named Jody. Jody lived in her bedroom and would reveal herself in the form of a large pig with glowing blood-red eyes. Thinking this description to be strange and also thinking that it was just their daughter's imagination, George and Kathy wrote Missy's new friend off. But at one point, the couple would pass by Missy's bedroom and upon listening in, they would hear their daughter talking to someone or something in her room. But whatever it was, was answering her back in a deep-toned voice. Weirded out, 
they opened the door to the girl's room. Within, they would find their daughter talking to something outside her window. Together, the Lutzes would see two large red eyes staring at them from outside. Terrified, they began to snatch their daughter up in an effort to get her to safety, but Missy would attempt to calm them down. She told them that it was only Jody, and she wanted to know if she could come into the house. Missy would continue to have strange interactions with the entity known as Jody. The family became more and more convinced that something was horrendously wrong. As they recalled, when they had initially toured the house, the realtor had shuffled in discomfort. She said she wasn't sure if she should have told them before or after she had showed them the house. The couple, raising their eyebrows, asked her what she meant. She then told them that this house was where the DeFeo murders had taken place. The couple remembered a year prior when the newspaper's headlines had described the gruesome murders of an entire family and all at the hands of their 23-year-old son, Ronald DeFeo Jr. With a rifle in his hands, he crept into each room and shot his parents and all of his siblings in their beds while they slept. All victims were found face down, each one never having woken up during the slaughter of the other. During the trial, Ronald claimed that voices told him to kill his family, but that he had no recollection of the murders ever taking place. He was ultimately convicted and given multiple life sentences in prison. Concerned for their children, George and Kathy had asked them if they would be comfortable living in a place where such tragedy had occurred. The children nodded, and the deal was made, and in order to put themselves more at ease, they had called Father Ray to bless the house. Remembering the strange look and words of Father Ray, George decided to give him a call. During that conversation, Father Ray would reveal that during his blessing, he had entered what was now known as the sewing room upstairs, and here he was shaken to his core. He had heard a dark, evil voice, which told him to get out. Unsure of what to make of this, George took the father's words to heart this time, and tried to figure out some kind of solution. That night, George lay down next to his wife, staring at the ceiling, unable to sleep. He pondered the fact that everyone else slept on their stomachs, except for him. They all slept face down, just as the DeFeos had. As he laid there, he began listening to the massive storm that was raging outside when suddenly there was a bright burst of lightning that lit up the entire bedroom, temporarily blinding George. He called out to Kathy and reached for her, but Kathy was not by his side. Once regaining his sight, George now saw that his wife was levitating and floating towards the ceiling. He then began to hear loud bangs emanating throughout the house, coupled by the screams of his children. Their beds were lifting up and slamming on the floor by themselves. Panicking to wake his wife up, George screamed her name, and as she came back to consciousness, she slowly descended back to the floor. At the moment, unable to fully absorb the situation, George alerted Kathy and the two began to rush towards their kids. As they darted out of the bedroom, they witnessed yet another odd situation. Their dog was walking backwards in circles while vomiting. As they ran down the hall, lightning would flash and thunder would roll as heavy rain pelted the windows of their home. Upon running towards their kids, they then gathered the children and their dog and rushed everyone to the living room downstairs. 
As the storm raged outside, they contemplated what they should do next. As monstrous bangs and growls could be heard coming from upstairs. Together as a family, they would weather this hellish, stormy night. The following morning, unsure of their plans, but knowing that they cannot stay in their home, the Lutzes fled. Upon their departure, they had only managed to live within the home for exactly 29 days. And despite the entire family witnessing the storm, there was no record that it ever existed. No weather reports. No forecasts. Nothing. Trying to make sense of the horror that plagued their family, George and Kathy, upon an acquaintance's recommendation, would contact world-renowned paranormal investigators, Ed and Lorraine Warren. In just a few days, the Warrens would enter the home for an investigation. As soon as Lorraine crossed the threshold of the door, she immediately began to sense a heavy sadness, a depression that permeated the entire house like a fog. As the couple did their initial walkthrough, upon entering the basement, Ed described feeling a powerful, inhuman presence. He said it felt like standing beneath a waterfall, the sensation of having something heavy bearing down upon your shoulders and soul. After the initial investigation, the Warrens compiled a team of psychics to assist them. Among them was a woman named Mary Pastorella, and Mary considered herself to be a time walker, a person capable of visualizing and experiencing the past of a location. During her walkthrough, Mary began reciting the Lord's Prayer. As she made her way up the stairs, Step by step, she would witness a group of figures saying the prayer backwards. This sight concerned and deeply disturbed her. After completing the investigation, Lorraine stated that whatever is here, in my estimation, most definitely is of a negative nature. It has nothing to do with anyone who had once walked the earth in human form. It comes right from the bowels of the earth. The Warrens told the Lutzes that they felt that their house could only be saved through a cleansing performed by an ordained priest, and an experienced one at that. However, the Lutzes were uncomfortable with this, saying that they felt like they'd be risking their lives, and how could they be asked to do that for a house? Instead, they decided not to pursue the cleansing. They would cut their losses and return the property at a massive loss to the bank. They chose this route instead of putting themselves or their children in any further danger. Although the Lutzes no longer owned or lived in the house, this would be far from the end of their story. Years later, a book and movie adaptation would popularize their story along with the allegations of it all being a hoax. However, this seems unlikely, especially since George and Kathy lost not only their life savings, but the majority of their credibility due to the story. They would continue to maintain the validity of their experiences for the rest of their lives. George once stated in a 2002 interview, It's my prayer that everyone in this room never go through such a thing, but if you know someone that does, the hardest thing for people is the loss of being able to communicate with anyone else about it, not being able to find anyone that can intelligently help. It's not talked about, it's not understood, and when it happens to you, you become a burden to everyone else. Alongside losing their credibility and life savings on the house, they had also left every item within the house and on the property. This included a boat, furniture, additional vehicles, everything. 
they had only departed with the clothes on their backs. So was this story true or false? Hoax or reality? That conclusion is ultimately up to you to decide. George and Kathy would divorce in the 1980s, but remained good friends until the very end. Kathy would pass on August 17th of 2004, and George on May 8th of 2006. Their children, from what I saw, are all still with us. Some lead more private lives, while others are more so in the public eye with their professions. The agent that initially sought the Lutzes out following their departure from the Amityville house ended up essentially tricking George and Kathy into signing away their rights to their story. So they had no say in the book that was written or the movies that followed. They also didn't profit from them whatsoever, even though their story, their experience, and their names were all used. The house known as 112 Ocean Avenue still exists, but it has been renovated and the address changed to discourage sightseers from visiting it. The quarter round windows have been removed, and the house today looks considerably different from its depiction in the films. The local residents and authorities in Amityville, New York, are unhappy with the attention that the Amityville horror brings to the town, and tend to decline requests to discuss it publicly. And who can blame them? Ultimately, the Lutz's family's paranormal experiences paint an all-too-familiar and terrifying story, one of horror, terror, and confusion. Like a fly landing on a spider's web, once the house has you, it never wants to let you go. Luckily for them, however, they did ultimately escape from the demon that was lurking and waiting to consume them all. Thank you guys so much for watching this new video. Please give it lots of love for the algorithm. A like, a comment, and a share are always greatly appreciated. Thank you again to Incogni for partnering with me on today's video. Besides that, again, I did just want to let you guys know that I will be at the Tennessee Haunts and Legends Expo taking place in Nashville, Tennessee at the Nashville Fairgrounds on Saturday, October 21st. I'm going to be giving away some posters, some stickers, and signing whatever you guys want if you so choose, as well as chatting with some awesome people and hearing some spooky stories. There's going to be tons of stuff to do, and it'll be a first for me but hopefully the first of many meet and greets to come. With that, guys, I love you all, and thank you for crafting such an amazing community around me. And I will see you guys very soon with another new video. This has been Cody here at Mystery Archives. Please remember to stay safe out there and take care.